All flights are now boarding. Welcome to Indie Game International. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, I am here with Philip Zibkovitz of Caligari Games. Uh, Philip, how are you today? Hi, thank you. I'm doing fine. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, so, Philip, before we get started, I would very much like it if you could give us the elevator pitch for the game we're here to talk about, The Great Perhaps. What is it? What is it all about? Uh, so, basically, The Great Perhaps is a 2D adventure puzzle game uh, with a time travel mechanic. Uh, the, the easiest way to describe it, it's it's like this level in Dishonored 2 with uh, two different time layers that you jump around. Yep. And uh, it's all made in this uh, 2D cartoonish art style, like in the Valiant Hearts by Ubisoft. Oh, Valiant Hearts. I love that game. That game's awesome. Yeah, yeah. That was our main reference for the visuals. Okay, so you mentioned that another game that it's similar to. Have you ever played Legacy of Cain Defiance? No, so in I did game, not. In that, that's like a 3D, like, beat them up i guess but in that game there's all there's a similar mechanic where there's a lot of puzzles where you basically you can switch it from this ruinous time to the present you know what i mean and you can kind of do that at any time which is similar to your game so yeah that's that's cool i actually uh i find out about uh, several other games that uh, have this mechanic uh after the release of our own game so <laughs> i didn't have a chance to to make a proper uh, research on that matter but uh <laughs> It was pretty cool to find some games that are close to ours because uh, personally, I was making the Greg perhaps mainly for myself, like the game that I would like to play myself. And uh, it was pretty cool uh, to find out some new games from our fans and players that yeah. were similar to ours. That's that's really yeah. great. You guys did a really good job. I. Straight up, I'm a huge fan of The Great Perhaps. I hit, you up because, <laughs> I hit you up because I played it on my Switch. I beat it. It blew me away. I'm a huge science Thank fiction you. fan. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm a huge science fiction fan, and I love video games. So in terms of a video game, it's really fun. And the sci-fi story that you tell is really, really good. And so I'm curious, the idea for this game, did it start as a story first or as a gameplay perspective first? Like, how did the idea start? I'm assuming it was your idea. Yes, it was my my idea. And it started like a... It was actually a, a film script at first. Because uh, before the game dev, I... Uh, I was, I'm not only was, I am a film director. I'm, I still uh, film stuff. And uh, that was a script that I was trying to write. And uh, while I was writing it, I realized that it will be extremely hard for me to find any funding for a film like that. And uh, I put it aside for some time. And the later, when me and my friends, we decided to start the uh, Caligari Games and do The Great Perhaps, we, we decided that it will be a pretty cool thing to try to make that story as a game. And uh, actually, the time travel mechanic uh, was something that came uh, later. So from the beginning, it was just a story about the... Uh, cosmonaut that comes down to the earth to find it all destroyed. Okay. So you're actually like tripping me out right now because I recognize your voice. Uh, I don't oh, yeah. I, I don't think I have to ask that you are the voice of the main character. <laughs> yes, I am. Yeah. Okay. So I'm curious. You're into film. You say you're a film director. You made this game pretty much on your own, it sounds like, or you you play you hold many roles and you're a voice actor how'd you get so multi-talented dude uh well to be honest i did not make it on my own i had a, a really great team behind me it, not only behind me but in front of me it was me who was behind them <laughs> all the all of the time so all the programming all the artwork uh music uh, sounds everything uh uh, were not made by me. I was just the one uh, producing this whole flick and uh, 
uh, telling people what to do and how to do it mainly uh, because I'm not, as you said before, I'm not so talented. <laughs> okay. Maybe I'm talented in hiring talented people. So that that's probably how it worked. Well, that that's a really good lesson, I think. So tell me about creating Caligari games. And like you just said, the realization that in order to make this idea you had become a reality, you had to get people on your team who could execute. So how did Caligari games come about? And so uh, may, maybe just start there. How, how did this company, your company, Caligari Games, begin? Uh, so basically, uh, there are three main uh, people who started this whole thing. It's uh, me, uh, our narrative designer, Lisa Michelazze, and uh, our uh, sound designer and composer, Andrei Tulenev. So basically, all three of us, we thought of making a game studio and making some games. And at first we actually managed to make a little fun game uh, about our friend, something like an uh, inside joke about him. It was super simple. Okay. But uh, we really wanted to make something uh, finished. Like, even though it's something small, but we really wanted to make something finished to uh, understand the whole process. Maybe it was not the right way to do it, but still... <clears throat> Um, it worked and uh, we really liked and we really enjoyed the process itself. So uh, later uh, we've been joined by uh, our friends who were actually uh, looking for some uh, startup opportunity to invest. So we worked with them and they invested in us making the Caligari games. And that's how it started. And uh, to be honest, like, most of our team are not actually some friends of ours back then. Now they are friends of ours, of course. Right. <laughs> but uh, when we started, we we were just uh, putting uh, some uh, silly lines in on, on forums and uh, on Facebook and uh, in the Russian version of Facebook called Vkontakte. And uh, we put some little things there to, to try to find people. And eventually we did. We find us some team. So who who worked on, who were the main people working on this game, The Great Perhaps? Um, it's really hard to tell because uh, there were actually a lot of people working on it. Um, but it's not like full-time thing. Uh, full-time thing, it was only for uh, our main programmer and uh, for a couple of animators it was a full time thing okay. um, but f for the artists who were doing the background artwork and uh, character artwork uh, it was like part time job for them Got it. So, uh, but still every one of them they were present from the beginning till the end Okay. And uh, we managed to complete the game <laughs> together. Okay. So I'm curious. You said that you came up with the idea. Uh, yeah. Who was the first person on your team that you came to with the idea? What was their reaction? And how did the initial idea, like your initial idea, is that what we see now when we play the game? Or how did the game evolve throughout the de development cycle? Were there significant <laughs> changes or... Mm, well, the most significant change was the thing about, as I said before, about uh, the uh, time traveling uh, lantern that the main character used. So uh, that was the main thing that we changed and added to the concept of the game before we started the production. But uh, for some time before this idea came up, it was just a story about uh, a cosmonaut in the post-apocalyptic Soviet style world. Okay. So, and the main uh, references to us were Limbo and Inside. Excellent. Uh, so yeah, just simple adventure games, uh, side-scrolling thing. Right. But uh, then we were trying to figure out how to make our adventure a little bit different. And uh, that was 
probably the time that I played the Dishonored 2, and I really, really enjoyed the level with the time traveling. And yeah. back then, when I was playing that level, I was all, all, always thinking, this is so good. Why it's just the on, only one level? <laughs> right. I really want to play a, a whole game like this. Awesome. And uh, yeah, that was probably the moment we decided uh, to add the time traveling thing. And it it was fun, but it actually doubled our artwork because every single level should have been uh, drawn in two different times. Yeah. <laughs> so, sorry to interrupt. So, I'm because it's interesting you say that because I think that was a really good idea because probably some of my favorite moments in the whole game come from this switching the time period, right? Even the tiniest things like when, whenever you're in a populated area and you switch back to the to the the present, I guess it would be, or no, yeah. the past. Uh, the people, if you, if you appear in front of people, they're like, ooh, like they get excited. <laughs> like they notice that you just appeared in front of them. And I love that little like attention to detail. I love those moments. Additionally, probably my favorite moment in the whole game, besides the ending, would be the suicidal writer, which only which is so impactful because of the time travel mechanic, right? Yeah. So what, how did, like, did you write the script for this whole game? Um, yes, I was uh, the main writer on, on that one, but uh, I, I also had uh, our narrative designer, Lisa, uh, who was helping me with that. But, uh, you know, I think one of the main mistakes that I made, that I was too pragmatic in uh, how I approached the script. And uh, I don't know why I did it like that. Maybe because I was still working full-time job somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it was almost literally written on my knees while I was sitting uh, in the studio uh, and holding uh, my laptop on my knees. And uh, like 90% of the dialogue were written probably like an, a few hours before the recording session in okay. the studio. So I just knew, I just had a little plan on how things should go, but I didn't have them written down directly what exactly uh, who will say. And uh, when we will, when we were putting these uh, dialogue lines in the game, um, it was also another uh, lesson for me because half of the lines didn't end up in the game because I was still writing it like a film uh, dialogue. And uh, when it was in the game, I realized that it's just breaking down the pacing of the uh, storytelling. So I cut out a lot of lines. And uh, but I think it ended up well in in a way. But still, uh, from my perspective right now, as more... Uh, experienced uh, developer, uh, this is not how it should should be done. <laughs> okay, so I, I know you just explained it, but maybe distill that lesson into like one quick piece of advice in terms of how to write the script of a game for any dev that might be listening to this. Um, well, first of all, I think that the most important uh, piece of advice should be uh, that the developers should be prepared for what they are making. And before you start the production and before you hire people, before you spend money and your time, it is very important to have uh, most of the things written down. It's uh, the whole document of how you see your game is not just a document to be used. It's it's like a map that you're walking with. And uh, if you have the map, you can actually tell how much uh, you, you've passed and uh, how much time you have spent and how much time you will need to spend later. So it, it is a very important to make some plan like that. And the script for the dialogues and the script for the game is a part of the document and it should be done before. And uh, the other thing is that don't have, don't be afraid of cutting things out. If you feel like, something is too much. Okay. 
<clears throat> well, I, like I said, I absolutely love that moment with the, with the suicidal writer. Um, I think that was probably my favorite moment in terms of like utilizing the, um, the time travel mechanic. Um, I think that was also a moment where usually when you're playing a game, I think you're, you, you're normally like, how do I progress? How do I find the key or whatever that opens the door? Whereas in that case, I was not concerned. Like I re- literally wanted to help that guy. I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't care about progressing. I was like, I want to find this guy's book so I can show him that like he should not jump off this roof. So you did a really good job. I know you said you made some mistakes, but you did a really good job in terms of the script. I was totally Thank into you. it. Yes. Um, you mentioned uh, also in terms of the script, can, I want to talk about the ending. So the ending, the whole thing is compelling, right? I mean, I love science fiction. Yeah. But then the ending hits and you realize it really made me want to replay the game like instantly, right? Because you realize that this monster that you see in the beginning, who is that? Is that is that's obviously the life the life form, right? Yeah. So, um, spoiler alert. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, but uh, the idea was that uh, this monster that is following us and who is trying to take the lantern from us uh, is actually us. So oh. they there are three. Uh, three main characters in this game. Uh, The cosmonaut himself, uh, the the child version of him that we meet. And basically that uh, moment when we meet ourselves is the moment that uh, made us as as a child want to become a cosmonaut in the first place. Right. And uh, that thing, that black uh, goo thing (laughs) that is following us is also us but it's just us trying to stop us from the cycle that we are in. And uh, as the main character says in the, in the end that he will keep trying to save the world. He will keep trying whilst he still has this uh, lantern whilst he still can. And uh, the idea was that uh, basically he was jumping from time to time so much that uh, the lantern started to change him. And we actually had a little hint that we wanted to implement that over time in in the, each new level, um, there would be a black goo from the lantern coming on the character's hand. Uh, but it was too late for us to implement it and uh, we couldn't make it, unfortunately. But uh, that was the part of the plan. And, and this is why in the last shot of the game, uh, there is uh, this artificial intelligence L9 uh, talking from the black goo guy and basically the moment our character uh and the artificial intelligence thing uh catched uh, a signal from a life form in the very beginning of the game in the first first level right. is the same moment when uh, the black goo fellas uh, artificial intelligence catched our presence from the beginning of the game so yeah, it's like a whole circle always running around. That's really cool. I I didn't catch all that in my first playthrough, but <laughs> I caught enough to be extremely intrigued and I absolutely love that ending. Um especially like I feel like shorter games, you know, indie games, I think if they're narrative driven, if you have some kind of punchline ending, like it really makes the whole experience that much richer and makes you want to go back and play it again. And I have every intention of playing this game again, especially based on what you just told me. <laughs> um, tell me about L9. Why is she called L9? Um, so I got to be honest. Um, I'm not the one who uh, made that name for the artificial intelligence. So I might not be super precise with the, why exactly it is named like that. But uh, basically uh, in the, in the old uh, book, some fantastic Soviet book, there were a woman called uh, Lenina. And basically it's uh, her her name was taken from uh, Lenin. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, and with all, um, 
Soviet aesthetic that we had. Uh, we thought that uh, Lenina sounded like L9, and basically we named uh, our artificial intelligence in uh, in the name of that character from that book, who was also named from Lenin Lenin himself. And we're like uh, traveling through the uh, destroyed world that was Lenin that 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 Lenin tried to build. I would okay. say <laughs> pretty deep. Uh, yeah, who, who <laughs> too deep for for just a name. <laughs> right. right. Who, who voiced L nine? Was it someone on your team? Uh, yes, it was actually our narrative designer Lisa. Okay. Yeah, she gave her her voice. She did a very good job. Uh, how much uh, is that? Just her voice in like a robotic tone, or did you have to mess with it in uh, like with the mixing? I'm curious. Um. At first, we thought we will need to mess uh, with her voice in order to make it more robotic, but uh, we almost didn't do that. We we did that only a few times, and uh, <clears throat> most of the work and the acting she did herself. And even more than that, here's another little detail on that. Uh, but while we were recording her, um, as she says in, in, in the beginning of the game, that she's an artificial intelligence who is keep uh, learning things and okay. trying to become better at things. And uh, we tried to do a little thing that she's more robotic in the beginning than in the end. So while she's speaking to the main character, she also uh, learns how to speak better. And that's why in the, in, in the end of the game, she speaks almost like human. Very cool. Yeah, yeah that was one of the ideas as well. <laughs> It's amazing. Like, I feel like I got so much out of this game just playing it on my own without speaking to you. And it, I really love that talking to you, like, you realize that it's so much richer and so much deeper than I guess what you get as a player. But I think some of that mystery is there. And, and that's why I was curious about all these things. So it's good, I think, that it's multi layered like that. I loved their relationship too, in terms of like uh, storytelling. I think there's a moment where he's like about to like end it all. And she says afterward, I'm glad you didn't jump. And like that part was amazing. Like, I mean, I didn't, I wasn't like teary eyed, but I was like, wow, like that was intense. I thought, I don't know. I guess I'm just saying in so many words that I, I love the game and I love the script. I love the story that's told. <laughs> so, so sorry to be like a fanboy, but I just wanted to mention, it's cool that you're like right here and I can tell you these things in person. Thank you. It's really, uh, it's really important to us. So, what is the game? The game initially came out on Steam, correct? Yes. And then ported to Nintendo Switch. Yes, and uh, also PlayStation and Xbox. Okay, cool. So, tell me about that. Um, the uh, what's the word? Strategy behind that. Uh, a lot of games come out on Steam first. Tell me about the porting. How did that come about? Did you have to? Did you have to prove the game was successful on Steam before you port it, or how does that work? No, not really. So um, in the beginning, uh, we had a, still have a, a publisher, and uh, the game was published by Daedalic Entertainment, okay. uh, and they um, they had the exclusive rights for the game, and uh, they were the one who was going to uh, make the port of the game for Nintendo and PlayStation and stuff. And it was basically their job. And uh, almost a year after the release on PC, we, we kept we kept asking them if they will do it, and they didn't do it. So uh, we took those uh, rights back from them. Okay. And we signed with another publisher, uh, a small but very cool uh, publisher from Poland called Dragos Games, and they are like our new best friends <laughs> cool. because they were helping us a lot and they uh, did the porting and they did the publishing on the platforms. And that is pretty much why uh, there is this gap between Steam release and the uh, console release for almost a year. Okay. So how did how did that... I mean, how do you dissolve that relationship with the publisher? Was it just, was, is that a complicated process? And like, uh, no, I got to say, uh, 
thanks to the Delic, uh, they were willing to uh, give us the rights back. It was not a problem at all. So it was just a matter of one conversation. And we directly asked them, like, guys, uh, okay, so you, you have the rights for that thing. And uh, are you really planning to do something about it? Or maybe if you're not interested anymore, maybe you will just give it back to us. And kind of we, 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 <laughs> we know what to do with it. <laughs> and right. We would like to do something. So, yeah, they said, okay, no problem. You can take them back. Wow. Yeah. Didn't expect that, but I'm happy for you. That's awesome that it was a smooth transition. Yeah, thankfully, it was smooth. Um, so I want to get into a little bit about you as a person, right? This podcast is not just about the games or the studios. It's about the people who create the games. I'm assuming you're a gamer. Yes, I am. How long have you been a gamer, would you say? Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to tell. I think since I was maybe five or six years old, something okay. like that. <laughs> so how does, I know you said you're a film director as well, but how do you go from a gamer, like so many of us are to realizing you have an interest in making games to then making it a career? Like, can you give us like an abridged version of that story? Like, how do you go from gamer to, I can actually make this a career and be an artist and also sell games. Like at what point did you realize it could be a career or it could be something that you do for a living? Um, that's a hard question because <laughs> my, my uh, path through all these artistic forms uh, was not from gamer to game developer. It's uh, it evolved in different forms, and basically, uh, at first, I wanted to be a musician because my parents are musicians, and because my parents are musicians, professional musicians, they totally didn't want me to become a musician because they didn't like it <laughs> as much. Well, not not they didn't like it. I mean, they they wanted me to have a, a childhood because when they were kids and they were in the musical school they almost didn't have any childhood and they had their own thing about it and they didn't want me to lose that time and uh, after that i i went to play in a little theater and uh, i was an actor for some time and after that i thought like okay so maybe i can become a director not just an actor because i was really uh interesting interested in uh making new worlds that was probably the main thing even from the beginning because i i I remember watching uh james bond movies and indiana jones movies and uh from after james bond i wanted to become a spy after indiana jones i wanted to be a historian and, (laughs) and stuff and at some point i realized okay so Films makes me films feel like that, and uh, the whole thing of uh, discovering or and uh, researching new worlds or new things uh, that is really what is interesting to me. And so I decided to become a film director. I made uh, several uh, short films. I made a documentary on the Russian television. Uh, I was making a lot of uh, um, commercials and. Uh, commercial films and stuff. And at some point I uh, realized that career wise, uh, I'm a little bit stuck uh, like an artist. So I was, I still had a job and I still earned money, but it was not uh, interesting anymore. And uh, this is pretty much where the game development came in because uh, uh, I realized that it's, a very interesting and developing new art form. Okay. So, uh, and basically we, we don't know it yet in which era exactly of this art form we are in. So it, as it was in the film industry with the black and white and silent movies, and then the sound came around and then the color came around and, uh, the game industry itself is not very uh, old yet. So maybe I can be one of those who can uh, uh, do something interesting in it and still be making new worlds, new settings and telling stories. So, yeah. Uh, and if if we 
talk about it technically how I uh, became the game developer. It's actually it's pure luck because uh, f- for the first project uh, I didn't have to look for funding. The funding f- found me and it never happened before with any other project it's because just my friends came to me and said like okay we have some money that we would like to invest maybe you can help us uh, out with uh, some of your friends and maybe someone doing something and it was right about the time that we, we thought about making a game studio and we didn't know how to make it because we didn't have money for that yeah. and it's kind of worked out like that and uh now I can say that as an indie developer uh, with uh, a title that is released on several platforms and uh, with another title that is going to come out hopefully till the end of this year, but uh, realistically probably in the beginning of next year, uh, that actually made a very good uh, portfolio for me. Yeah. And uh, I was already approached by by different uh, uh huge companies in order if I would like to work with them. So really? that was, that was cool, but, uh, <laughs> but I'm still working uh, on our little things. So you're saying um, like larger de- video game development companies approached you? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, there, there was a moment like that and not even one, but uh, the thing is that uh, is another piece of advice for uh, indie developers is that, there are a huge amount of uh, professional events, so uh, like festivals and stuff. But it's like business to business events, not not uh, meeting the customer, but meeting other business, uh, uh, other people from the industry. And uh, I was performing on one with a lecture about Kickstarter, and uh, on another one I was presenting my pitch for our new project and stuff, and. I met a lot of people and some of them later followed up with a letter asking if I was interested in working with them. Okay. So this is how it worked. So the, your advice there is to attend these events and get involved? Yes. Yes. I'm curious because you said these some of these events are business to business, right? Not business to customer. Yeah. And I'm wondering if there is a, if you're on the inside like you are as a developer, is there a, discernible palpable difference between the way your game is received by the gamers and the way your game is received and looked upon by other people in the industry. Like, is there a separation there between like, like, okay, like your game sells well and people say it's a good game. Those are the gamers. And then people in the industry say to you like peer to peer, like you made an awesome game. I'm looking forward to what you're going to do next. Is there a difference there? I'm curious. There is a difference, actually, and uh, both good difference, positive difference, and negative difference as well. So uh, talking about the gamers, um, the gamers are trying to really look into your game. So they are fully experiencing the thing you did. And uh, I mean, you know, it's uh, a common thing in our production to say, like, Okay, so I want it to be like this. And when the player will be playing my game, there won't be me nearby saying, uh, okay, so uh, we wanted to make, make it better, but we couldn't. But you you can just imagine, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there won't be such thing. <laughs> so obviously, uh, when we work, we try to make it better for them. And uh, the player is is the person who is experiencing it in 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 fully and those from industry they are more often to see flaws and mistakes and uh and f- they have this professional eye for things and right. uh, they are like uh, spoiled gamers unfortunately spoiled <laughs> right. yeah because they are no longer can not see some of those things right. this is how their eye work yeah and the other thing, uh, which is maybe a negative thing, uh, uh, but I didn't met it uh, a lot, but still there were a couple of uh, times that it happened, uh, is that some of the players said that our game is too expensive. Like uh, 9 dollars for a two-hour game is too much. 
in Russia, so as you know, as you maybe know, in Steam there are regional uh, prices. Yep. And the different regions have different price. So basically in Russia, the price was uh, much lower, like really much lower, almost more than twice than lower than 10 bucks. Okay. And we still received uh, letters from Russian players saying it was too expensive, even though it it was almost twice cheaper than a ticket to, to cinema. <laughs> right, right. And uh, when you are in the industry and people really understand the work you've put in, they are more, they more acknowledge the work you did. And that's why they never ask and never say that it's something is too much. Well, not in obviously stupid cases, like some 10 minutes flash game selling in for 50 bucks, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's obviously too much. But uh, um, there were a lot of support from uh, industry and from uh, fellow developers who said like, okay, don't don't worry about it. It's just uh, some uh, cheap fellas. Look at other people who is not th- saying anything and they are enjoying the game. So don't take it too close. So you, like you said, you are a gamer. Um, yeah. And I completely sympathize with what you're saying. Like, I I do not think The Great Perhaps is... I mean, how do you put a value on... I don't know how to put a value on it, but I don't think it's worth less than $10. I think $10 for the experience I had is completely justified. Um, but as a gamer, and I'm, I'm sure maybe this is an impossible question because you can't remove yourself from a game that you made. But in your opinion... Does your game stack up to other games that are that cost ten dollars? Like, regardless um, of knowing the work you put in, I'm curious. Like, what is your justification? Uh, my my justification was that I was um, making basically I made the research, so it's not like we just put a price tag on random. Right. Uh, so I made a research on how other games are doing, what price do they have, how long they are, what kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, visuals they have and stuff. So I, re- I had a, f- a huge uh, list of the games and the prices they have. And uh, basically, I had in my mind when we were working, not only uh, visual references, but also uh, references of the games who costs the same for the player and I was trying to evaluate whether our game is uh, in that range will the player get as much content or as much interesting and and joyful things from our game as from this one for example so yeah that that is how I came up with the uh, price tag of 10 bucks and I don't know as a player uh, I don't usually hesitate to uh, to buy games, but still, even in, in the times when I feel like uh, I'm too short on money and I cannot buy it at the moment, I do understand that Steam has lots of sales. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's not a problem. And I, I if I cannot buy the game right now, I can just set it to my wish list and wait for the uh, sale. Right. So for the discount. So it's something yeah. like that. I would say full disclosure, I got the game on sale. I got it on Nintendo Switch on a sale. And I think um I, I didn't go looking for that game. I hadn't heard, I'd never heard of The Great Perhaps. I just saw I just went to the sale page and I saw it and it looked awesome and I paid for it. I can't remember how much I paid for it, but less than $10. And now that I've paid less than what you charge, I'm telling all my friends that they should pay for it and they should pay $10 for it. You know what I mean? So are you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. But I'm just saying like the sales, I mean, you set your game at a price and then you put it on sale and it puts it in front of more people's eyes, right? Yes, of course. It's, it's, it's a part of the uh, game. I would say it's a part of the rules on how the market works. Right. And uh, there's nothing bad about sales, nothing bad about discounts. And, uh, of course, I can say, like, yeah, but uh, we did work for 10 bucks. It should be paid 10 bucks. No, no discounts for the game. Of course not. (laughs) 
of course, I understand that uh, not everyone can afford themselves such a game. Or, uh, as you said, you, you you didn't even hear heard about us. Uh, and uh, the, the sale page is something that actually helps us, obviously. Yeah. So sales are good. Discounts are good. I agree. And, uh, of course, uh, there is this uh, timeline of how the game sells. Uh, from the release till the end of times, hopefully. <laughs> and uh, obviously, the the most of the peaks of the sales of the game is on the times when you put discount on it. Uh-huh. And uh, it actually helps you to uh, to keep growing your base of players, of people who recognize you and who will most likely be interested in the next game you're making, if they liked the first game, of course. So, yeah, it's it's a good thing. Yeah, I would say anyone, if you're a developer and you're listening to this, I mean, I don't know if you have power over this or if this is a publisher decision, but you should totally put your game on sale because like you just said, it puts it in front of more, more, more people. I love science fiction. I love indie games. I love 2D adventure games. I love narrative driven games. And yet I had never heard of your game. I'm the audience and yet I never heard of it. Saw it on sale, bought it, love it. Now I'm talking to you. You know what I mean? So yes, I'm curious if, if you're interested in getting into conversation about this. Um, Cause you, I'm just wondering what your opinion is. There is this, always this conversation about how long a game is, which should determine the price. Right. And mm-hmm. If you'll recall a video game called No Man's Sky, right? Yeah. So that game, obviously all the controversy around it, I mean, it's basically like cyberpunk is kind of just a repeat of that, although kind of on another scale. Um, Everyone said it wasn't what it was supposed to be, right? It wasn't what they advertised, right? I bought that game the day it came out, spent $60 on it. I played it for at least... 50 hours before getting kind of bored of it. So that's kind of the way I justify that. I didn't, I didn't waste my money. Like, sure. It wasn't what we all thought it was going to be, but I, I thoroughly enjoyed a 50 hour experience in that game. I think that's worth $60 personally. And then you take another game. Like I recently earlier this year spent $60 on the game bio mutant. Uh, I played it on my PS4 and I loved it. I didn't play it for as long as I played No Man's Sky. And yet I completed it and I don't really have any intention of playing it again. And yet both both experiences to me felt justified for the $60. Do you have any kind of opinion on that as a developer or as a gamer? Well, I often hear uh, this idea that uh, the price of the game should be uh, made from the hours of how much hours uh, the player spends in the game. And I do not agree with that thing because uh, I don't know. There are a lot of games that are like pure masterpieces and they are not only so much work, but also so much thought and some incredible process in it, such as uh, what remains of Edith Finch. Yep. It's the game, like, I, you can finish it in th- three or four hours or something. Yep. And it's amazing. It's something that I will remember <laughs> till the last day of my life. Right. And the experience I get from it, it's uh, much better than my several thousand hours in uh, some Dota 2 or something like that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's still much better, but... Uh, the games as an art form has different uh, ways on how you can consume the product. So um, this is where I think the two types of uh, games uh, uh, exist. So basically there are games purely on gameplay and uh, it's something that you can, in, in some cases you can just play for the infinite time Yep. Because the gameplay cycle is built like that. And there are narrative games with the beginning and the end. Yep. And the, both games may be cool, but you still receive a different kind of uh, uh, enjoyment, different kind of uh, feedback from them, yep. and different kind of emotions. Um, and 
I think the most important part is that uh, it is always a transaction, it's money for the emotions. And if you do receive the emotions and you are happy with them and you really enjoyed it, I think it's uh, worth the money. Right. And even, even though if maybe it's not some masterpiece or something, but just a really good story with some interesting ideas, yeah. it's uh, maybe, maybe it has some bugs in it or something, but still, I think uh, money worth the emotions that you receive. I agree. And it's interesting too, um, that like movies are the opposite. Pretty much every movie is a set amount of time. It's between 90 minutes and like two and a half hours. Some movies go longer, but you can, and you pretty, they pretty much all cost the same amount of money, but then you can go, you can see a total masterpiece that's two hours long. And then you can go see a movie that was a total waste of your time. That was two hours long, same amount of money, same amount of time. It's interesting. Um, I don't know. Moving on. I want to ask you about your new game that you guys are working on now. I noticed on your website, it's called whatever land. Yes. Tell me about that. Or as much as you can tell me, I'm curious because it looks really interesting. Uh, So the idea is that whatever land is um, not so classic point and click quest adventure. Uh, uh, why not so classic? <laughs> so basically, uh, the, the first thing it's it's not linear, not like uh, the regular adventure point and click that you've played. So uh, once you start the game, you're free to go wherever you want in the city and uh, do different stuff in random order. Mm-hmm. So uh, the the story, the the construct of the story works this way that. Uh, you can uh, complete levels in random uh, order. The other thing is that uh, each level can be played at least in two completely different ways. And uh, in most cases, those ways include uh, content that you will not receive in the other playthrough. So we don't have like too much levels, of course, but each level has at least two ways on how you can play it. And, uh, of course, uh, we have this branch, branching dialogue system and uh, you can uh, build different relationship uh, in the city with people and it will actually backfire to you in a good or bad way at some point. And, uh, oh, yeah, and we also have this little experimental thing in the game that uh, there is this uh, turn-based board game that is very popular among uh, people in the city. And so our uh, point and click also includes a turn-based board game in it. Yeah. Wow. So it's a little bit experimental on all sizes, <laughs> Yeah, but uh, I'm something curious. like that. Does the, you mentioned uh, that there's two ways to play every level. Is that maybe like a carryover from what you did in the great perhaps how every level has to kind of two versions. Was there any type of thought? The comparison? No, I never thought of that this way, but it's an interesting take. <laughs> okay. Um, what, what is the, I'm curious just from like a advice perspective or like kind of being able to relate with other developers on your, in your dev log and in the press kit for the game, it mentioned that whatever land was one of the top games to look out for in May of 2020. Yeah. That was a while ago, and you mentioned the release date isn't until potentially the beginning of next year. How do you get, yeah. your, how do you get your game in front of people at such an early stage? Like, how did that come about in May of 2020? So uh, the production of the game started uh, even before the release of The Great Perhaps. Okay. So once the, all the artwork and animations were done, we still had almost six months for the programming department and the quality assurance folks at the dead Alec to polish the great perhaps. And while they were doing that, uh, we were already uh, uh, developing the art style of the new game of the whatever land. And we are doing some new stuff with our uh, artists and animators. So, we thought that we will be able to release the game sooner and we are almost a year even maybe more than a year 
uh, more than a year late <laughs> to what we originally planned. Planned. Okay. Uh, mostly because uh, of the adjustments that we had to make to the game after the release of the grape, perhaps. And why? Why did that? Why is that? So here's a third and maybe a very interesting input for the other indie developers. Uh, the thing is that the grape, perhaps, is a linear adventure game. Yep. And uh, we. On the release and a few months after the release, we had a blast on Twitch. We had a lot of streamers playing our game. And uh, we even received on, on some festivals, we even received a streamer's choice award or something. Mm-hmm. Um, with the, the second game also, actually. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the thing is that uh, those streams of the game did not bring us any player base. Because uh, the game was short, two hours long, right. and the streamers played it through the whole game through on one or two streams. Got it. And basically, all the content and all the experience we had in the grade, perhaps, uh, was already covered in, on the stream. And those who were watching the stream, they didn't really have the need to go and buy our game. I can see that. Yeah, and it uh, it really struck me back then because I was at first I was really happy that we were uh, on fire on Twitch and it was pretty cool. But then I realized that it it did not bring us any new uh, customers, as okay. I would say, and players. Um, so once we realized that, we uh, implemented this idea of the uh, non-linear gameplay with the uh, two different ways on how you can approach each level and uh, that you have several almost nine different endings of the game and stuff so uh, our aim here is to try to make an interesting storytelling adventure game but it would be still interesting for the viewers to try the game themselves so that they would understand that if they will play it in their own way they might have their own unique experience. Okay. And uh, once we realized we need to do that, uh, well, it's pretty much doubled <laughs> the uh, production. And uh, this is why we are so late. And the other thing is obviously COVID and uh, um, due to COVID uh, related complications, some part of our team had to leave the production. Okay. And uh, we are only now we are getting back on track, and thankfully we will soon be finishing the game. Awesome. Well, that is actually really good advice because I never would have thought of that. I mean, it makes sense when you say it, but that the release of your game and almost this one avenue of success of your game really informed how you make your next game, and. I think my unique uh, angle in doing this podcast is that I am not a video game developer. I've never made a video game. I'm just a gamer. So I'm not afraid to ask like the quote unquote dumb questions that one developer might be afraid to ask another. So maybe if I was sort of aware of what you were just saying, I wouldn't have asked the question like why? Like why would people streaming have a negative effect on the sales of your game? So that's really interesting. Um. So, but at the same time, I feel like indie games getting delayed is not a new thing. It's not unique to you, right? Yes, <laughs> it it helps. And um, we we for the second game, we did a Kickstarter campaign uh, on the summer of 2020, okay. and uh, unfortunately, uh, we with all the COVID thing and all this uh, stuff, we messed things up and uh, we didn't deliver the game yet for okay. for our supporters and backers on the Kickstarter. But uh, I am so overwhelmed with support and good things they say. So, I mean, I but basically, uh, I did not deliver what I promised for their money but they are still being super supportive. And it is actually what uh, helps me keep doing this and 
keep proceeding to the uh, end of the production. Got it. Yeah. Um, I think based on the great, perhaps I would, I would have no problem holding out uh, waiting on your next game, regardless of how long it takes. I love the great, perhaps I've said it before and I'm really excited about whatever land. I didn't know that you could wish list it now on steam. So I'll be doing that today for sure. Um, and you can also play uh, a prologue, the first chapter, first little chapter of that. Really? On steam. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. I might have to do that. Um, so I have a few more questions that I ask every developer. Uh, so not necessarily specific to you. I'm very curious to hear what your answers will be. So what is release day like for an indie video game developer? Well, for me, it was a nightmare. <laughs> because uh, I thought it would be uh, a joyful, uh, s- super cool day that I will remember remember till the till the end of my life. But uh, unfortunately, it uh, ended up being uh, one of the worst days of my life. And the first uh, two or three days after release, it was probably the closest moment I was to a depression because we had a really bad sales and uh, our promotion and the uh, the whole publishing thing they really uh did not do a great job and uh we uh, we will be uh, we will be publishing our new game ourselves and okay. right now when i'm working on it uh, on the publishing and uh, right now while while i'm doing things uh, on how to release the game i see how really bad of a job uh, our publisher did Okay. So, um, I don't know, a lo- lots of stupid decisions. And uh, you would think that uh, such a big publisher as Daedalic Entertainment uh, might know what they're doing. But uh, unfortunately, on how they approached the release of our game, it seems to me it's uh, either they didn't know what they were doing or it's something else. Okay. Some other, other thing. Yeah. So, the the other most important thing that I would like to share with other developers while seeing all this uh, rant <laughs> is that you should make yourself a Steam page as soon as possible. It should be very, very important to make a Steam page quick uh, because uh, the Steam algorithms, uh, they work in some mysterious ways but uh, if you have uh, an, an interesting title and uh, a good artwork and uh, a short but informative uh, text on your store page, you will be able to gather wish lists every day okay. just from the algorithms without doing anything yourself. So basically, at the moment, for example, on the on the whatever land, we receive eight to ten wish lists a day, just from the algorithms. Wow! Without doing any uh, promotional work. It is a great. And, sorry to interrupt. What? It's a great. Time. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, thank you. And uh, the other thing is that uh, for our first game, the amount of wish lists we had before the release uh, was almost three times lower than we have already on the second game. Uh, And we are not even close to release yet. And we didn't even start the uh, marketing campaign yet. Okay. So uh, it is really important. And fish lists are important for the release date. And because the, uh, once again, the algorithm uh, on the release date works the way that uh, if there are a lot of people coming to your page, not necessarily buying the game, but they are coming to your page and uh, they're reading it and looking at the artwork, uh, it pushes it, it pushes your game on the main page of the Steam okay. further and further. And obviously, uh, like like the wish list they won't be necessarily converting to a lot of sales but all those people will receive an email and some of those people will go to the store page to check out the game the new trailer and stuff and uh, it will push the algorithms to push your game 
to people who will actually buy it. Got it. So yeah, it is uh, important to do things like that. And uh, this is why the release was a nightmare back then. And hopefully the new release date will be something completely different. Okay, well, I, I, I do want to ask a question that's not part of my ask every developer question because of what you just brought up. How, how has this transition been to publishing your own game? Is it something you recommend to other developers? Like what's the main, is it just a big learning process for you? Like how are you handling it? Yeah, it's still a big learning process. And, uh, you know, I was actually thinking about making a full lecture or something like that after the release of whatever and uh, while comparing the two different approaches on how to release a game, like with a big publisher and releasing it uh, ourselves, I will be able to uh, tell more only after the release, when I will have my numbers. Because maybe right now I'm thinking I'm doing something right or something more uh, cool and uh, more interesting than our publisher did. But maybe it won't end up in any sales at all and it will be still the same thing as before. And But, but this time I will be able to, uh, <laughs> at least I will be blaming myself and I will I will know that what I did wrong without uh, this stupid feeling of uh, not knowing what, what is happening and uh, if we can change something right. or not. Well, it sounds like you're, I mean, honestly, dude, it sounds like you, you want to give back, right? Like you want to teach other people the right way to do things. And I think that's pretty awesome. Is that, that's the point of making this, this lecture you're planning? Yes, of course. And uh, actually, uh, I might have a little bit more to share because uh, the, the whole process of how we will publish the game is uh, really experimental. And uh, even not only in how we like generally publishing the game, but uh, we have a lot of experiments with our marketing campaign and uh, things like that. And uh, we still have a publisher on the second game. We we even have two publishers on the second game. Okay. And it is also an experiment because uh, for uh, Steam and uh, GOG and all the PC market, we are publishing the game ourselves. Okay. For the consoles, uh, the publisher and the porting team will be the same as on the great, perhaps the Polish studio Dragos Games. They will do the porting for the consoles, and they will do the publishing for the consoles. And also, we have uh, an Asian market publisher. It's uh, Whisper Games. It's a Chinese uh, publisher who who will be doing uh, all the Asian languages localization and handling all the marketing on the Asian market that we are not capable of doing ourselves at all. So uh, this is like this three-way publishing and uh, like one for the consoles, one for the PC on the uh, North America, uh, South America and Europe. And the other one is with uh, this Chinese uh, publishing team doing all the work on the Asian market. So, um, I'm really interested in how it will end up and the, which of the markets will work better and if we can help each other at some point. So, yeah, it's, it's always a learning process. And I will be really glad to, glad to share uh, my experience once I will have uh, more information on how it will go because it was something that I was uh, really looking for myself. Okay. Uh, when I was trying to get into the game development. And uh, I actually learned a lot from the podcasts. We, we had a Russian podcast uh, on Russian language with Russian developers mm-hmm. telling their stories. It was probably one of the main uh, sources of information for me and from inside information of how things work and how things should be done or should not be done. So, yeah, I think it is very important for developers to share their experience and uh, how they do things. And once again, getting back to what I said before, this is why it is so important for game developers to uh, go to uh, professional events and uh, to do networking and things like that. Okay. That is really fascinating. And I commend you for trying to get the word out and trying to help other developers. Uh, if you're if you're interested, this is a conversation for another day. But when that does happen, I would love to have you back on the show, and you could like 
talk about that experience. I think that would be really, really helpful for, for my listeners. Um, so I got just a couple more questions. Now, these next two questions, I think we've gone over them a little bit, but I'm going to ask anyway. I'm curious what you'll have to say. Uh, what do you, what is one piece, one piece of information that you would like to relay to the gamer? What is something you as a developer, if you could say one thing to gamers as a whole, what would it be about developing video games as an independent dev? That's a hard question. <laughs> you know, I don't really know what to answer to that because even though I had my experience with uh, talking with uh, actual players of my game uh, on events and stuff, the whole discussion was not about telling something specific. It was, it was fun. It was uh, sometimes it was stupid and <laughs> and so on. So I I just don't want to be too uh, <laughs> too complicated. So uh, yeah, I think uh, the best thing will be is that there are a lot of real real gems in the market really real good indie games even spe- specifically indie small games that you are most likely not aware of and uh, i encourage you to discover all those new worlds cool i think that's really good advice um so now on the flip side again you've given so much information on this so you you know but i'm curious what you'll say what's one piece of advice one piece of advice distilled piece of advice that you would give other independent video game developers? The number one thing you would tell them? Um, hmm. Can I say two things? Absolutely. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So the first is uh, very pragmatic. Uh, Work on your papers like do 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 your work on papers and if you're going to sign with a publisher or something hire a lawyer it's, you you should do work on on papers it's it's very important okay. it's really really important to do things like that yeah and the second thing is it is very important to finish things i know a lot of developers who are making their like project of their life the the, the, the most important game in, uh, in the world and they're doing like for 10 years straight and stuff don't just finish the project it's uh, it's really important to finish things and uh, when you finish things it allows you and gives you more power to start and finish new things and after that you can you have even more power to start and finish another thing and it is very uh, important for mental health to finish things Okay. That's really good advice. I haven't heard that yet. So I very much appreciate that. And I think my listeners do too. So, uh, Philip, I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Really. I did. Um, I'm going to, thank you. Me too. Yeah. I just have one more question. Uh, sure. So I want to ask you to call out another independent video game developer, someone that you respect and admire in this industry that you think would be, an awesome guest on this show, like you were an awesome guest on this show? Uh, I think you should totally call for Nicola from Cowsmonger Studio, who did the game Encodia. And uh, they're actually doing another one, Clunky Hero, right now at the moment. Okay. I would really like to hear more from Nicola because he's also a film director. Okay. And uh, we have a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot in common. So it would be really, really interesting to see how his process is built and how how he came to game development from filmmaking. It's something I was curious about and I haven't had a chance to ask myself yet. Okay, I'm going to get on it. Tell me tell me the name of that the game that he has. It's out already? Encodia. Okay. E-N-C-O-D-Y-A. Awesome. And that's on Steam? Yeah, it's on Steam. And I think uh, it should be soon on consoles as well okay i'm gonna i'm gonna try to get them on the show for you dude i'm gonna do it for you um, cool thank you <laughs> so uh 
once again, thank you times a million for doing this. I think that everything you shared was very valuable to anyone listening who wants to make games. I also thoroughly enjoyed discussing the great perhaps and the story moments. I'm happy that you were able to get into that. Uh, so just tell people how they can get your game, how they can how, like, you know, wish listing whatever land and how can they get the great perhaps. Okay. So the great perhaps is available on uh, Nintendo switch, PlayStation four, Xbox one and on steam and GOG store. Got it. So you can find the game by uh, looking for the great perhaps as, as the main character did looking for a great perhaps (laughs) pun unintended (laughs) so i'll be really happy to share my story with you and uh the whatever land is somewhere near with the great perhaps and it would be cool if you would wish list it as well got it all right Thank you so much. Uh, well, actually, last thing, is there any way people could get in contact with you? Like, are you on social media, Caligari Games? Like, any way to contact the company? Uh, the best way is probably by using the form on our website, caligarigames.com. Got it. Uh, as I, if I remember correctly, is, is how you contacted me. I believe so. Yeah. Uh, and the other one is Twitter. We have a Twitter account, and uh, you can hit us up there. Awesome. It's probably two main sources of contact with us. Perfect. Uh, I can't recommend The Great Perhaps enough. I think it's an amazing game. And now I know that Philip, the, uh, one of the main people who made it, is also awesome. So I encourage everyone to check that out. And one more time, Philip, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and uh, coming on my show. Thank you for having me. Wait, stop the music. Quick announcement. Nicola over at Chaos Monger Studio has agreed to be on the show. He was my very first called out guest. And in a few days from this moment in which I am speaking, I will be talking with him about the gorgeously atmospheric indie title, Encodia. I did it for you, Philip. Massive thank you once again to Philip Zibkovitz of Caligari Games for coming on my show and sharing his wisdom and knowledge and stories about this industry. I love your game. I think you're a great guy and a very talented developer. Get The Great Perhaps on Steam, Switch, PS4, Xbox One, and the GOG store. Do fill up a solid and wish list whatever land. It seems like a very interesting game. Find Caligari on the web at caligarigames.com or on Twitter at Caligari Games. That's C-A-L-I-G-A-R-I-G-A-M-E-S. If you want to talk to me, you can email me at sumadrepodcasts at gmail.com. You can find me on Twitter at IndieGameIntl and please share this with someone who you think will like it or benefit from the indie game industry knowledge on display here at IGI. I am here to serve and learn. I want to learn as much as I can about the games I love and the people who make them. And since I've met a handful of you, I want to serve you in any way that I can. You are a group of very awesome people making very awesome things. Okay, before I sign off, I need to thank Kevin Lesage for making all the music that you hear in this podcast. And I need to thank my voiceover artist, Misha Krilov. Email me at sumadrepodcasts at gmail.com if you are interested in getting either Kevin or Misha to make music or do voiceover work for whatever project it is that you are working on. They are both immensely talented. Okay, thanks again, and please, please, please join me next time. I've got really cool content coming next week, but it's a secret. Okay, so see you then. Thanks. Thanks.